Good evening and welcome to Iowa News and Views. Thanks for joining us. My name's Joe Balkum. I'm a county supervisor over here in Johnson County, which includes the metropolitan areas of Iowa City, Coralville, and North Liberty, including a number of other small communities. You're watching Iowa News and Views. We're a current events program focusing on state and community issues of interest to Iowa. Uh, we've said it before, I'll say it again, you're not going to see many of the uh, topics that we address on this show anywhere else on TV, in particular focusing on things happening in our state. And so we encourage you to keep joining us and tell your friends to do the same. The title of tonight's show, 30 Long Years, you might be wondering what that refers to. Well, Iowa is the only state in the country that for the last 30 years has failed to elect a Democratic governor to uh, oversee the state operations. And tonight we're going to focus on that, uh, that situation. And our guest is State Senator Tom Vilsack, a Democratic state senator from Mount Vernon. Uh, Tom is a candidate for the Democratic nomination for governor. Tom, thanks for joining us. It's good to be here, Joe. Tom, what's the effect of having uh, 30 years of one party in control of the state uh, uh, house? Well, there's uh, a lot of effects, Joe, but one of the effects we can talk about is the fact that you've got a bureaucracy that has not been changed, has been entrenched for 30 years. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of folks who've been department heads for, for long, long periods of time. Uh, and as a result, there are no new ideas. There's no new fresh uh, concepts being looked at. It's basically the same old uh, uh, vision of, of, of Iowa. And, and really what you get is, well, we can't do it because it's not been done that way, that kind of response. Uh, and it really is a time for change and a time for shakeup and a time for turning the bureaucracy upside down. Very good. One of the, the other areas, besides appointing department heads, is appointing persons to boards and commissions. Well, there, yeah, there are literally hundreds of Iowans that are selected uh, on an annual basis to fill a, a wide variety of advisory and appointed committees. And these committees do important work in the state, and uh, it's really not a very good idea for one party to have control of that apparatus for a long period of time. I liken it to, uh, to stew. Uh, I like to cook, and uh, I said uh, not too long ago at a function that uh, democracy is kind of like a stew, that every once in a while you have to stir it, otherwise uh, it burns on the bottom, and uh, some uh, young lady piped up from the back, and you've got to put fresh vegetables in the stew to maintain the taste, and that's absolutely correct. Very good. Well, I've heard you talk before, and one of the issues that I've heard you talk about is improving uh, Iowa's economic position. Uh, there was, over the last year or so, there's been a report out in, that you helped write strategies to improve the quality of life for Iowans. And in that report, they talk about the need for uh, Iowa. We have a shortage of workers, and we have a shortage of workers trained in the kinds of skills we need. Mm -hmm. What would be some ways to approach that as an issue for our state? Well, first of all, I think that uh, we need to have a clear purpose and a clear vision to our economic development strategy in the state. Uh, in the past, the strategy and, and the vision has been simply job creation. I think we have to begin realizing that it needs to be more than that in the 1990s and the 21st century. I think we need, need to do a better job of recruiting our young people. Uh, I go into a lot of high school classrooms uh, on a frequent basis and I invariably ask the question, how many of the high school seniors that I'm talking to see themselves in Iowa four years uh, from graduation? And very few of those youngsters raise their hands. I think we need to do something about that. I need, we need to encourage young people that there is, in fact, opportunity in this state. Uh, I also think that we need to begin looking at a different way of approaching economic development. Uh, our economic development strategy is a lot like the lottery. Uh, all of us basically uh, contribute our tax dollars into this pot, and then a few lucky winners receive uh, fairly large payments out of that pot, uh, and basically a couple of companies benefit. Uh, the reality is it seems to me that we ought to be looking at a more regional approach to economic development uh, where the emphasis is on infrastructure needs, uh, the kinds of things that not only help a single business but help all businesses. Education is talked about in that report as well and trying to improve our education system not only K through 12 and higher education but tr vocational training and technical training. Uh, what do you see, see as the needs there and, and how would you approach that? In particular, how, how are we going to afford to improve our system? Well, that's a very complex question uh, and it's actually a question that I like to start uh, at the very beginning of life, if you will. Um, it seems to me the state of Iowa needs to do a better job of providing parents the tools to allow them to be their children's first and best teachers. Uh, most of the research that's been done recently tells us that the first three years of life are extremely important in, in the development uh, of a youngster's interest in education and creativity and imagination. 
Uh, there are a lot of states that surround Iowa that have very good programs that help young parents be their children's first and best teacher. That's something that Iowa should be involved in. Uh, then we need to do a better job of supporting our K-12 system. Uh, again, the reality is that uh, we're one of few states who does not provide infrastructure uh, monies for, the, for uh, K-12, through and as a result, approximately a third of our school space violates fire and safety codes. Uh, we also need to be concerned, particularly in our urban centers, uh, of the rising number of youngsters who are in the classroom. We're asking teachers who are doing a marvelous job to teach 25 or 30 kids at the same time. It is extremely difficult to do that and do it in a, in a meaningful way. I think we also have to do a better job of explaining the relevancy of what we're learning in the classroom to, to real life. Uh, it seems to me that kids ought to be encouraged to go to school rather than uh, being given the opportunity for their the part-time employment that they're so interested in uh, at McDonald's or Hardee's. Uh, there needs to be an understanding that there's something that they can learn in the classroom that's, that's valuable, that they, they need to use their time in that regard. And I think our school systems need to do a better job of providing the kind of work opportunities that have a connection, that give kids the opportunity to see the connection between what they're learning in the classroom and what they're going to need to, to, uh, to be gainfully employed. Most of the new jobs that are going to be created in the economy uh, over the next 15, 20 years are not necessarily going to require a college education, but they are going to require a very good high school education. Mm -hmm. And it ought to be one of our goals uh, in this state to provide every single youngster who graduates from our high school with the tools to allow them to be a productive citizen from day one. Well, I was thinking about this the other day and thinking about the education I've received in, in elementary and high school. And Are we talking about different kinds of things that even in our lifetime that we learned? We're talking about some, some different kind of skills that people need? I think so. I think uh, that there's a, there's a recognition that, uh, that people need to, be, need to be able to communicate well. That not only means uh, being able to write and to, to read, but also to listen. Uh, there are people skills that need to be developed. Uh, there are, uh, for some youngsters, there need to be particular skills or tra trade skills that they, need, they can and should develop. Uh, we have, uh, right now in our educational system, we spend about 75% of our resources on the 25% of our student population that actually goes to and graduates from a four-year degree. It seems to me that as we look at restructuring education, we need to make sure that we devote sufficient assets to the other 75% of the population that will not or does not require mm -hmm. a four-year college degree. And that may mean changing some courses around. It may mean uh, discussing curriculum. It may mean uh, uh, a greater relationship between the community and a school to provide uh, youngsters the opportunity to, to work and to learn at the same time. One of the areas where our current governor has focused a lot of economic development attention is the development of prisons in, in the state, and it's a significant cost to us. Can we, how, are we, how many prisons do we need? How many prison beds? And, and can we continue to build prisons and fund education like we need to? It's going to be difficult to do. Uh, the reality is with the prisons that we've built, uh, we are just basically staying even as we create new laws and new infractions and, and stiffen penalties. Uh, we create a larger uh, population. There are some estimates that just the work that we've done the last couple of years will require a couple of new prisons in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, my sense is that what we need to do is we need to have a shift in focus. Uh, we need to understand that there is uh, much to be gained from prevention programs. Going back to my concern about youngsters uh, the, at birth and receiving their parents receiving assistance, I think we need to recognize that, it, that, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, we have not really focused on prevention programs in the state. We've not allocated sufficient resources in prevention programs. Uh, in addition, we haven't looked at other alternatives besides prison for punishment. Uh, our community-based corrections facilities and our community-based corrections programs uh, can be very successful if they're given the resources uh, and the support uh, to accomplish uh, uh, punishment in a meaningful way without the necessity of building large and expensive prisons. You know, it is an unfortunate and, and I think uh, it says a lot about the current state of Iowa that so many communities will vie for a prison and will be willing to spend literally millions of dollars to lure a prison mm -hmm. into their community because they sense that that's their best chance for, for decent jobs. Right. Uh, I, I think we can do better. Mm -hmm. In terms of the death penalty, we've talked about the last few years in our state. What's your position feeling about uh, reenactment of the death penalty? Well, I'm opposed to it on a number of grounds. Just look at it this way, Joe. <laughs> 
We know that it's going to cost $50 million to implement the death penalty, even on a limited basis, over the next 10 years, if it were passed tomorrow. Put $50 million on this table and answer the question, how would you best spend that $50 million to fight crime? Uh, you would have several options. One would be reinstatement of death penalty. You would know in that 10-year time period you might execute one or two people. You know from most of the major studies it does not deter crime. You know that we have one of the lowest homicide rates and violent crime rates in the country, and those states that use the death penalty most frequently have the highest homicide and violent crime rates. Uh, you could spend that $50 million putting more police on the streets. You could spend that $50 million with juvenile uh, programs. You could spend that uh, $50 million with better education support for at-risk children. Uh, the reality is that there are a lot of ways to spend $50 million to more effectively fight crime uh, than reinstatement of the death penalty. And I, I think that it's, frankly, it's an issue that, uh, uh, that the Republicans use in an effort to divide Democrats against each other. And I would say this, if the Republicans truly believe if they truly believe that the death penalty is a good public policy, then they have the power right now, mm -hmm. with the governor being Republican, the Senate being controlled by Republicans, and the House being controlled by Republicans, to pass the death penalty. If they fail to do so when they have the power, then it shouldn't be an issue. We shouldn't be talking about it. We shouldn't be diverting our attention away from the meaningful issues of what this campaign should be about which is a government that hasn't changed for 30 years, is a government that has allowed our population to basically stagnate, a government that has allowed our young people to, to uh, leave the state in droves, that has allowed our, our average family income to decline uh, as a percentage of national income. Uh, these are the issues, economic issues, kitchen table issues, uh, not death penalty issues. Sure. Another issue that's been somewhat divisive in our state over the last few years is the whole question of a woman's right to choose whether or not to have an abortion. Uh, what's your feeling about that? It's an interesting issue from a state perspective. When you realize that the state has essentially in the recent past uh, enacted parental notification, uh, enacted statistical reporting, uh, and has currently on the books a criminal statute that discusses uh, the late-term abortion uh, procedure. Uh, we have in place just about all of the state laws that the current federal law and the federal court law allows us to do. So really, there isn't much more we can do in this area. Uh, it really is not an issue in, in the sense that, uh, that there are significant uh, policies that could be adopted uh, as long as the federal law stays the same. Uh, you can pass all of the laws you want to restrict or regulate abortion. You could pass a law today that basically said no abortions at any time for any reason. The reality is there will still be abortions. The reality is that ultimately it is the woman's choice. The woman can choose to violate the law if she so chooses. Uh, given, that, given that fact, uh, and given the fact that there are very few people that, f that, that really uh, favor abortion, okay? I mean, personally, I would not favor abortion. I would not counsel my youngster to, to, uh, to have an abortion. I would, I would look at the other alternatives. Uh, I'm adopted. Uh, and I, I think that the state ought to be looking at, at adoption. I think the state ought to be looking at creating a support system for people that make the decision to bring a child into the world. Uh, I think what we ought to be doing is taking the passion and the emotion of this issue and redirecting it on where we agree. And I think we do agree that adoption is a viable option. I think we do agree that a support system needs to be created so that those who decide to bring a child into the world have a reasonably good chance of being good and successful parents. That's where our time, our energy, and our passion should be directed. Not on an issue that, frankly, the state can do very little about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even if the state were to do something about, the choice would still be there. Good. You're watching Iowa News and Views. Uh, we're talking with State Senator Tom Vilsack, Democratic candidate for governor. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think 30 years is a real long time to have one party in control of the governorship. And, I guess I'll let you know I'm a Democrat and I'd love to see uh, some change at, uh, at that position. I think it's time and, and uh, we're talking with one of the candidates that would like to have that job. Tom, thanks for being with us. Um, taxes. People are talking about income taxes and property taxes. There's been more discussion. We, see, we had a 10% cut in the, the income tax this last year. There's more talk about more, more cuts maybe in the coming year. Uh, there's others saying we need to take a more thorough look at our tax system to make it more progressive. Uh, what will a Vilsag governorship do on the tax questions? 
Well, first of all, this year uh, we ought not to uh, be very uh, inclined to cut taxes uh, or cut them deeply. Uh, the reality is if you're going to do any kind of meaningful reform, it's going to take uh, money to basically do that. We passed up a great opportunity this last year. Uh, we had the opportunity to essentially lower rates to make our system much more progressive. Uh, we refused and failed to do that because the Republicans hang on to this antiquated concept of federal deductibility, which is difficult to explain, but it is essentially a loophole for the wealthy, and, uh, and they protect it. Uh, we, we hang on to that, and as a result of that, what we have is a system today that penalizes the middle class. Uh, when you consider that the middle class, those who make uh, $75,000 or less, make about 50% of the income in this, in this state, but pay 62% of the income tax, you realize it's an unfair system. Uh, we could have changed that, but we didn't. Uh, it seems to me that, the, that one of the things we ought to be looking at is the elimination of that middle class tax penalty. Secondly, I think we need to be honest with people about tax cuts. We really haven't had a tax cut. Now, what we did four years or five years ago is we increased the sales tax. In fact, we've increased it twice in the Branstad administration. Now, that means we've added revenue, and it is the most regressive tax. So we've taken money from poor and middle class folks, and we have essentially redistributed it in, this, in the form of income tax. Uh, so we haven't cut taxes, we've simply shifted mm -hmm. them. If we are really going to cut taxes, then it, before we do that, then I think we need to have a conversation about what it is we want our state government to do. And I think we need to be very specific about the job we expect our state government to do. Because last year when we cut taxes, the Republican legislature actually increased spending by 6%, right. about twice the rate of inflation. That is not uh, being honest with the people. If you're going to cut taxes, you're going to have to look at what you currently, where you're currently spending money, and you're going to have to tell the people where you're going to stop spending money. And only until we do that, it seems to me that we, it's a little premature to talk about uh, massive tax cuts or even reforming the system. Uh, I think they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. We're running down on the time here. Let's okay. see if we can move through a, form, a few more issues. Okay. Let's talk about agriculture, a yeah. big part of our state's economy. Was it a mistake for us to change our corporate agriculture laws to allow uh, Murphy and DeCoster and some of these huge mega corporations to come in and, and set up these la large uh, Actually, we, didn't, uh, we haven't really had a significant change in our corporate mm -hmm. farming laws, but we basically have allowed these facilities to utilize uh, existing property that's owned by, by other farmers in, in order to, uh, to create rather large operations. Joe, the mistake we made, in my view, was uh, 10 years ago, during the midst of the agricultural crisis, when we had an opportunity to have a real meaningful debate and discussion and conversation in the state about the future of agriculture and what we wanted our, our farm system to be, uh, we chose, uh, Governor Branstad chose to ignore agriculture. He made the conscious decision to diversify economic development away from agriculture. Uh, that was a major mistake. And we should have recognized that the power and the strength uh, of our economy is in agriculture. And we could have diversified within. We could have created a lot of opportunities for small farmers, medium-sized farmers. We haven't done that. Now we find ourselves in a situation where we panic uh, because North Carolina or some other state has, has, has got more hogs or, or got more chickens or got more cattle, uh, and, and we are creating agricultural policy in, without, again, taking the opportunity to ask the question, what is it that we want our, our farm sector to look like? Uh, I'm pr not particularly interested in, uh, in the decoster type process. I, frankly, I was thinking about this on the way up uh, tonight. I remember watching uh, the TV westerns uh, when I was a kid, and you know the marshal was always given the power to order the guy out of town. You know, it seems to me that we need that kind of power with the coster. We need to show them the borders of the state of Iowa, and we ought to say adios. Uh, and we ought to give small and medium-sized farmers an opportunity to survive and prosper. One of the roles of one of the one of the challenges of the next governor in my view, is to recognize that the role of government in the 21st century is going to change. Uh, in the past, we've been pretty much service-oriented. In the future, we not only have to provide service, but we also have to provide information. Uh, information that's going to allow you and, and anyone else who's interested in change to be able to adapt, understand, and manage, and profit from change. That's an exciting role, and it's one of the reasons why I'm running for governor.
Very good. We're down to a couple minutes. Um, what's it must be hard running for governor. A lot of places to visit, a lot of people to visit and talk with. What's a typical day look like for you or a week? Well, a typical day starts with uh, uh, traveling to a particular location and meeting small groups of people and it mm -hmm. just continues throughout that process until late in the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last seven months I've put over 25,000 miles on my wow. car. The circumference of the world and I've left the, the state of Iowa. It is a challenge. It is hard work, but it is invigorating, it is exciting, because when you do it, you, you do two things. First of all, you get a chance to see this beautiful country we call Iowa, and you also get a chance to meet some of the finest people in the world. And the combination of those two things makes it a very worthwhile endeavor. Very good. We'll have to have you back, talk more about, more about the campaign. We're running down here on time. Uh, I hope your car gets good gas mileage. 25,000 yeah, miles it, is quite a lot of traveling. It doesn't, and it should. <laughs> I, that's one of the mistakes that I made when I started this. But uh, you have to have a car that's big enough to lug all of the sure. signs and the posters and the banners and all that kind of stuff that goes with it. Very good. Well, Tom, good luck with your campaign. We'd love to have you back as this goes on to talk more about uh, how it's going and, and other issues you're hearing about from people. And uh, I look forward to it. Good luck with that. Thank you. We have a new segment that we'd like to talk to you about tonight. It's called the People's Podium. And over the course of every show, we'll be having guest commentators come on and visit about specific topics of interest. Tonight, our guest commentator at the People's Podium is Clara Olson. Clara is a political and community activist from Cedar County, Iowa. She's going to be talking about the Iowa Industrial New Jobs Training Act, or commonly known, or not commonly known, but thought to be a little piece of corporate welfare. Clara. Let's consider who was a typical Iowa welfare recipient. Theodore Schwartz, billionaire at the age of 42, chair and CEO of APAC Teleservices, Inc. Roger Phillips, Canadian CEO of Ipsco Steel Producer, Regina, Canada, and Mount Pelier, Iowa. And Robert L. Peterson, CEO of IBP, which controls nearly 40% of America's total beef processing capacity, are all typical Iowa public assistance recipients. One of Iowa Welfare's programs is called the Iowa Industrial New Jobs Training Program, passed in 1983, 99 to 1, by the Iowa legislature in the depths depth of the last farm recession, allegedly to create jobs. Since that time, it has redirected about $240 million into corporate coffers under the guise of job training. However, under the Iowa Industrial New Jobs Training Program, for up to 50% of the public monies awarded to a company, no job training need be done at all. There is no requirement that the company show any need for their money. And the company need not demonstrate any worker actually needs job training. The company need not demonstrate that absent the transfer of public monies into the private milieu, they would not create the jobs anyway. Let me explain how the program works. A community college issues bonds called certificates basically so that no voter approval is necessary. Our example will be a hypothetical million dollar bond. We take about 15% off the top for community college, another 1% for the State Department of Economic Development, both of whom can do with whatever they want with with their share of that money. The rest, 3 or 4%, goes for bond attorneys, underwriting fees, etc. The remaining $800,000 is available to the company in two forms. Up to 50% is what is known in the jargon as OJT, on-the-job training. But it's really just show-up wage subsidies for the firms. If they have new workers, the firm gets a portion of their wages for a, quote, training period. They get OJT money even if the workers actually hired are well-trained. They get OJT money even if there is a high unemployment in that occupational category. Telemarketers, meat packers, for example. They get OJT money, the state DED claims, as an incentive to create new jobs, any kind of jobs, even minimum wage jobs, although there is no evidence that the jobs wouldn't have been created anyway, pure public assistance, it seems to me. What happens to the remaining 50% of our hypothetical $800,000? For that, business actually has to provide program services, in the words of the statute, Program services can and has included drug testing of employees, orientation to the company, managers going to seminars to maintain a union-free environment. 
there is no requirement that program services be directed towards production workers, not the boss. As if that is not enough, the company also gets a state corporate income tax credit good for up to 10 years after, afterwards for each job. The Iowa Department of Public Revenue does not even keep a separate track of how much this has cost Iowa in foregone tax revenues. Where does the money come from to repay the bond? We divert a portion of workers' state income tax withheld from their paychecks. Instead of going into the general fund, where it would be used to fund schools, local government, etc., it goes into a special community college fund to repay the bond and meet overhead costs. The DED supports this program strongly by the explanation that it is assisting in the, quote, planned creation, unquote, of new jobs, nearly 77,000 of them, they claim, since the program started. But there is no evidence that these jobs wouldn't have been created anyway and no evidence that we have helped anyone to get a good job, just subsidize big business in not paying a decent wage. In Iowa, total corporate welfare, direct subsidies, tax breaks, tax exemptions, accounts for approximately a billion dollars a year of public monies as compared to traditional public assistance, which accounts for only $100 million of Iowa money. The Iowa Industrial New Jobs Training Program is the true welfare scam in Iowa. What to do? Talk to your legislature. Elect a new governor. And see that the likes of Schwartz and Peterson and Phillips get off the public dole. And make sure that farmland industries is not added to the rolls by subsidies of the proposed agribusiness zone in Des Moines. Corporate welfare is a problem we can correct if we want to. But the voices of common men and women must make themselves heard over this issue. Speak up. Thank you very much, Claire, for that. Um, People's Podium, you're not going to see that anywhere else on TV. Keep tuning in. I'd like to thank our crew, our local sponsors around the state, our financial contributors. I'd also like to thank Senator Tom Vilsack, candidate for governor, for being with us. Uh, we'll be giving you some contact information in a second here uh, on how to contact him and, and go check him out when he's in your community. You've been watching Iowa News and Views. Remember, what's important is what you're doing each and every day in your community to make it a better place to live. Uh, you can go turn the TV off now. My name's Joe Balcom. I'm your host.